people who might not be aware of that, who are also playing the game, they would be sort of astonished at the, you know, the way the, the certain characters seem to know what each other is doing. Um, hmm. Now, you know, they're, they're, they're doing that because it's an intentional thing, but I could also imagine that there might be some sort of unintentional mechanisms where you get hints of things that are going on that can be done programmatically. Um, you know, it's a little hard to explain, but mm -hmm. um, you can certainly imagine a program that that uh, maybe whispers in your ear or, or gives you some some sort of subliminal um, indication of something um, hmm. that uh, you know that, that you can't quite put your finger on, but but that could explain certain paranormal uh, events. Mm. Very interesting. Um, and so, you also mentioned the the idea of the sorry uh, sorry to interrupt there. But no, no problem. The idea of the, the, the parallel uh, realities, th there is, you know, a, a perfect analog for that in the gaming world as well. A lot of these games will run on a particular server, um, and you, you know, you're in your environment on your server. There's a whole different set of people playing the game on a different server with the same construct, the same scenery, and the same, you know, ogres and and monsters and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and theoretically, there's not, no reason why you couldn't effectively teleport to a different server. Um, programmatically, it's not hard to do, uh, to, to copy somebody's, um, you know, all the, all the data that describes their character and the state of their character could be just, you know, moved right over to a different server. And mm -hmm. you know, if, if you were unaware that, that there was any other reality, you'd be pretty pretty shocked at that you'd be surprised that oh my gosh you know all of a sudden i'm surrounded by different people yeah. well you know you hear people describe scenarios like that and uh, maybe this is the kind of thing that happens hmm. very interesting almost like uh, well well again i guess that all the the possibilities so to speak opens up if if this were in fact a simulation that that we are a, a part of in in regards to that uh, we are obviously confined to certain types of laws as it is now. If we again talk a little bit about the Matrix, the idea there is that because of his ability to transcend some of the laws that are put up upon the character, so to speak, he he can do certain things that the other ones can't do. You know what I mean? Absolutely, yeah. Um, imagine uh, you know the, the the concept of a uh, of a UFO. Uh, a lot of people have seen UFOs. I've never seen one, but I don't. I don't discount the fact that other people have seen them. Right. Um, so, you know, what could account for that? You know, one possibility is that it's it's part of a program. Um, you you could imagine a uh, if, if you were playing a video game, for example, um, the the game itself could generate things that violated the laws of physics that the rest of the players were subject to. Yeah. Um, and and so when we see uh, objects that move around the sky and seem to make, you know, turns that would, you know, violate what we know about aerodynamics or whatever. Um, it could be a programmatic thing. It could be something that's that's generated programmatically. Um, it's a perfect explanation for it. In fact, I think one of the problems with this idea is that it's it it makes everything so possible. It's kind of hard to falsify. <laughs> <laughs> I hear what you're saying. I mean, the, the, that would imply potentially then that. Um, there could be someone uh, with with access to to uh, to the code or how you know people that know how to manipulate reality almost like you know sorcerers of of, of this word uh, world and they would have obviously certain abilities that <laughs> that the rest of us wouldn't have. Exactly. Um, think about how in games, let's say somebody discovers a way to um, kind of hack the game. Maybe they found out how to, you know, how to how to steal money or how to increase their uh, the, the the money that they have by a factor of of ten just through some hack. Well, the programmers of that game are going to have to fix that. They'll they'll have to apply a patch, and the patch will go in unbeknownst to all the players because you can put hot patches into these games. Mm -hmm. And uh, the same thing could happen in our reality. We could, you know, we could be moving along at a certain point and. Um, you know, discover nuclear energy and, you know, 
potentially destroy ourselves, and maybe the programmers put in some fail-safe mechanisms to keep that from happening. Mm. Um, you could certainly imagine all kinds of possibilities that follow that patch-like model, but it, it does sort of imply that um, that the quote gods or whoever you know might be running the reality is uh, is an active participant in it, and they're they're watching over things, perhaps. <laughs> That was very interesting. I mean, let's say then that this is being run by a, you know, a very powerful server, so to speak, uh, potentially some kind of, you know, quantum computer or something like that. Uh, I mean, the, the questions that arise is, of course, okay, it's, as you say, someone watching over the server, maintaining it, or is this actually, you know, out there? This, if you think about it, this potentially could actually be some kind of uh, Noah's Ark. I've heard this uh, theory before, by the way, but it's kind of a Noah's Ark, um, Noah's Ark experiment, where a lot of people have uploaded their consciousness into a machine that actually has been, I don't know, you know, sent into space or is, you know, standing on some other planet uh, because of um, the, that the conditions on our planet were, you know, uh, getting so hostile or the planet was dying or I, I don't know what you can put in whatever you want there, but um, th- this would imply, you know, that. Uh, someone could find the server, uh, destroy it, right? You know, have you thought about stuff like that? Sure, yeah. No, and, and you touch upon, uh, you know, a really interesting aspect of this, which is motivation. Uh, you know, what, what would be the motivation behind all of this? And, and, you know, boy, that's that's another thing that we could spend a lot of time talking about. But, you know, you, you provide a really good scenario. The Noah's Ark scenario is, is one very you know, palatable motivation. Mm -hmm. But as far as the reliability of the hardware, if you will, um, you know, I I think that that's something to sort of not worry about. And the reason I say that, I actually had a, uh, you know, somebody who who, uh, heard me on another show sent an email to me and and asked me the same question. Um, Having worked in the past in the um, high availability server industry, um, I know that, Today, we can we can generate uh, servers with uptimes of I think it's point nine 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 uh, six nines, and uh, we can also build systems that have um, triple redundancy and voting logic, which means that you have three servers that are running the same software and they're all monitoring each other. And if at any point two of them determine that one of them is out of step, they raise an alarm and and kick it out effectively. Mm. So if you use that kind of redundancy with the high availability mechanisms of servers, it turns out that we would have a mean time between failure of millions of years with today's technology. Mm. Um, but, so, but, but that still implies that, you know, power is available, someone is there, you know, looking over things, you know, I'm, I'm talking about, I guess, a little bit about the scenario that this is... Uh, standing there by itself and running, so to speak, and everyone has, you know, uploaded themselves into it, you know? I don't know, is that sure. possible, you think? Uh, yeah, I, you know, I think, it, I think it, it's certainly, uh, certainly a possibility. Um, and, uh, you know, I think, I, I think it would be very interesting to get into also some of the evidence for the actual programmed model as opposed to, you know, some of the evidence that there's something else out there that we, we've been talking about, too. Uh, mm-hmm. So if, if you don't mind, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the uh, quantum mechanics aspect of this, which Definitely. I, think, I find that one to be, you know, really very, very interesting. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you, for for uh, any listeners who might not be that familiar with quantum mechanics, um, one of the kind of fundamental concepts of it is that everything that, uh, that we perceive is quantized. It's in little packets. We, light is packets of energy, and matter is, is packets. Um, and even space itself is quantized at some point. And so most quantum physicists think that, you know, as you, when you look around a room, you see things, and it's, it's easy to tell that there's sort of a continuity of, of matter, of stuff, and of space between those things. If you were looking through a microscope, you would see there's a continuity there. And as deep as we can look into, I mean, we can now see uh, actual molecules with scanning microscopes. Um, but, but even at that point, all we see is, you know, a continuity of things. Well, when you get down to 10 to the minus 36 meters, uh, you hit what's called the Planck length, which uh, theoretically is the limit of resolution of space. Uh, 
Hmm. And that basically says that at that point, you can't even define anything between two plank lengths. It's either there or it's at the next one. There's nothing in between. Okay. Hmm. Well, what works that way? Everything in a computer program works the same way. The screen that you're looking at looks fairly continuous until you look at it close up and you see the actual pixels and the, you know, the red, blue, and green dots. Mm. Um, the models of things in virtual reality programs or in gaming have to have some limit. You, you model a tree, maybe you, you allocate 50 kilobytes for a model of a tree or 100 or something like that, but um, you can't give it an infinite resolution um, because infinite resolution would require infinite memory and infinite disk, and it would be infinitely expensive. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a limitation on the resolution of things. Now, let's say you have a, a tree that's modeled to a you know, pretty high-level resolution. As you look at it, um, you can't tell that it's, uh, that it's digitized in any way until you get very, very close. Uh, well, a, lot of, a lot of gaming companies now are, are applying... Uh, dynamic resolution adjustments. So the closer you get, um, you know, it brings in different models that will then model what that bark of the tree looks like close mm. up. Yeah, yeah. Um, you cut into the tree. You know, prior to anybody cutting into the tree, you didn't need to model the inside of the tree. As soon as you cut into a tree, now you have to model the inside of it, and you have to model it to the level of um, of instrumentation that your players would have to analyze it. But you don't have to model everything to that level. You only have to model the trees that they cut into, and you only have to model the ones that, uh, you know, that they're the cells that they're investigating, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, so this, this, this all kind of, you know, you see this huge analogy between quantum mechanics in the spatial dimensions and the modeling of objects in a computer program. Mm -hmm. And in the time dimension, it's the same way. Um, according to quantum mechanics, time is quantized as well at the level of 10 to the minus 30, 43rd seconds. Um, there's a, a physicist named Julian Barber who wrote a book called The End of Time um, where he takes that idea to its sort of logical conclusion and says that basically our universe is just a sequence of, of states. It's a state of information that's clocked every 10 to the minus 43rd seconds. Mm -hmm. Every Every, you know, there's nothing in between those two clock cycles. They're referred to um, by physicists as a jiffy. So okay. between one jiffy and another jiffy, nothing happens in our universe. Um, nothing changes or nothing moves. Nothing changes. Yeah. Well, so a, a computer works the same way. Right. Uh, the, the clocking of a CPU happens um, when the CPU clocks. Um, Bits get pushed into memory, into registers, arithmetic logic operations are performed, uh, disk reads, things like that. But in between the clock cycles, absolutely nothing happens. Hmm. So it's just a big state machine. And quantum mechanics kind of implies that our reality is just a big state machine, too. Mm -hmm. So, so the, the similarities are really striking. Um, it's very tempting to say, oh, well, that's that's ridiculous, you know, we'll never get to the point of, of modeling a reality to the Planck length and the Planck time, you know, because it was just, it's, it's so far beyond things. And obviously, you know, we can't push atoms around. Atoms are 20 orders of magnitude larger than the Planck length or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, but, but that, you know, a lot of assumptions are in those kinds of ways of thinking. Um, one assumption is that that quarks or strings even are the ultimate building blocks of matter. Well, nothing's ever been found to be the ultimate building block of matter. I, I can almost guarantee you that when uh, the, the, the linear hadron collider goes online and people start, you know, exploring things, they're going to, you know, dig deeper into uh, the nature of reality when people discover evidence for strings, they're going to realize that strings are made from something right. if indeed strings exist. Yeah. So, so I guess what I'm saying is that um, Moore's Law can just keep on moving along even at the 